The nuns never brought in a gay guy dressed as a woman to show us how wonderful the gay lifestyle is. I mean, maybe you could criticize that. Maybe both sides should be presented, as they say. Maybe that's true. But I think we've got to do that kind of thing with our eyes wide open. We don't want to damage kids. We don't want to see these suicide rates going up any higher than what they are now. And I think this is a consequence, the suicide rates. If we get these kids so messed up and confused that they are committing suicide, we might want to check ourselves on that point. <laughs> it's... <laughs> but you get... Mark Zuckerberg is a guy who believes in the LGBTQ plus a movement. And so they let me know. If you're not with that, you can't really be part of Facebook because they'll shut me off. And they'll shut you off. And they've shut me off a couple times now because I have something to say about that. So I don't think Facebook is a good platform for people like me who are outspoken and who may buck the trend or buck the tide. And this latest trend is the LGBTQ plus trend. And that's one of the reasons why I like Scott Lively so much is he's, you know, like me, he wants to push back a little. He doesn't want to give carte blanche credit to these uh, uh, people who want to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and never will they say enough's enough and we're equal, you know? Like equal opportunity and equality, it's got to be superior rights. So that's generally, I think, that's what you're going to get with a lot of different issues, you know. That pendulum, it's called, swings both ways. Uh, so anyway, I've got some new categories here. I'm in the Knights of Columbus, so that's a category. I was just on my running for Pope file. I was saying to myself, well, you know what? Some of these guys that are in the Knights of Columbus are just the most solid guys that should be, they should be taking on more responsibility for things in the church that they're not handling right now. And, you know, I was reading in the Bible, I was on this trip about, you know, the church, whether it's the body of Christ at the Protestant level or Catholic, I was reading about, you know, we gotta take care of our own and then not take care of everybody under the sun. At least take care of our own. And I think the, uh, in my notes I was making the criticism and it was dawning on me that the churches, the Christian churches should be involved with supporting maybe some drug camps for the Christian people who go off on the rails. And not just supporting everything generally. I mean, to, be, to maintain strength is in and of itself pretty big. So running for pope and running for president, these are a way for, or a platform for my projects to take root and get into some fertile soil. If I did one or the other, it would be a shame with me because I have these certain gifts that were given to me. So I want to use them. And that's no offense to Pope Francis, but he did mix it up with uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit funny, but I don't want to give in to the notion that these religions can really get fully involved in politics because everyone needs, um, let's say, the good, the good foundation that I got when I was a kid. That we kind of all need. And to me, it's more of what the kids need than what the adults need, because when you're given the right, the right book and the right rules when you're a kid, that you can carry with you for the rest of your life. You don't need a lot of preachy, preachy people, you know, giving it to you. You've got the book. You know ethics and right from wrong. You can read. So with kids, it's like my wife and I are both on the same page. You know, that's the most important thing. So Knights of Columbus, I'm newly into that. Now the top 100 project categories, I think I would separate, but I'm not sure about this. Running for Pope and running for President. Some of it's 
you might consider comical, but for me, this is my work, and I have to get it properly on the table. And there's a couple different venues for that. It's like I have these gifts. When I was a kid, I went to camp, and I was able to help out a couple of the camp counselors, and there was this priest embedded in the crafts department at the camp, which was uh, Camp Cathedral, and they kind of pulled me aside and they, because I was interested in doing things and working with my hands, even at that young age, crafts and stuff. And this was one of the gay priests, the notorious gay priests. I don't know which one he was actually. But they got talking to me and I got talking with them and I said, you know, I know about this stuff here. Let me go in and find out if this guy is able to... Um, keep his hands off the boy and <laughs> he couldn't and I told him that to make a long story short then there was no hanky panky but you know I let them know this guy's not measuring up here and back then I was I don't know how old I was maybe 11 years old I'm not sure but I fired the 22 I rode the fastest horse they had I went out on canoes I loved the camps oh I loved it it was great but I was able to help out, and as I say, I was, uh, I was the bait. But I asked them, they didn't ask me, these were good, solid guys running the camp. One was a cook. I remember him. He has all pockmarked from pimples and everything else. And the camp counselor was a heavy guy, heavy set guy. They were good guys, and we really were on the right page. We were on the same page. I didn't want these guys, these priests that were fondling the children. Because uh, I had heard about that, you know. I didn't want that to catch fire at all. Put the kibosh on that. Because I had experience with that, and I was okay with it, um, in that it didn't ruin me. Because, you know, that can ruin people. And boy, do I know that from being in the clubhouse world. A lot of people have been ruined by these sexual criminals who are perverts. And they go over the edge. And this could be homosexuality or heterosexuality, too. It can be both, of course. We all know this. But uh, I was able to help out there. So I think... Structural changes in all the churches are what we need. And to me, the one body of Christ thing is big. You know, we have Protestants criticizing, and don't oh, believe me, these people really are over the edge sometimes. And then we've got, you know, Catholics are not on going to um, get along with the Protestants what is it, like the Sunni and the uh, Shiites here? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. And it's not as bad as it could be, but I'm big on uh, one body of Christ. And to the extent that others want to line up with the Bible and the church, and I shouldn't say the Bible because I think when Jesus gave us the uh, Holy Spirit, he was giving us permission not only to eat the foods that made sense and that were not based in the Old Testament, but there's probably a string of reforms that are always going to be needed. For instance, if, if we find out as human beings that there are certain percentages that are born are going to be born gay, certain percentages, of course, heterosexual and maybe in between that they could give a, they could care less. You know, I don't know. It's not my area. I'm, I would love to be a sociology major, but I'm not. Um, I'm interested that in that kind of thing as much as fisheries, but you can't do everything. So I work on these projects. Base Gallup Revival, and the top 100 goes with the running for uh, pope and president. Running for pope and president goes with systems work. 
figuring out systems. That's what I do. And that could be government, it could be church, or both, or it could be a private system on a boat, or one thing or another. When I was a little boy, I prayed to God when I was in the sandbox, and I remember this. I've got a lot, I can even remember being bathed in the sink, you know, before my little sister was born. Mom would give me a bath in the sink. I was a, I was a baby. I have memories that go back a long time. So I, I was praying in the sandbox as I was playing with my little army jeep. I prayed to be an efficiency expert. I think God gave it to me. I think when it comes to efficiency and all these systems I work on, I think I've got a gift. So I think God just sends the oddest people sometimes, and I'm one of them. I really think I'm gifted as far as systems, efficiency, I call it complex systems, research and development. I say that um, I work on comprehensive, complex systems for the public trust. Now, what does that mean? A lot. It's like, I don't know, if you added fish folk, it may be eight or ten feet of what I do stacked up. So a person who actually does the hard work is going to get something. That's the rule. A person who does not do the hard work, pretty much assured that you're not going to get anything. So I could get nothing, or I could actually get something, or we could get something from my work. Well, that's the plan. Keep working, work hard. And of course, if you get put in the corner, as the nuns would teach me, wherever God puts you, that's where you got to do God's work. So I took it to heart. When I was put in the corner, kicked off Nantucket, put into Taunton State Hospital by the rich people, with their little helpers, their minions, in both parties, of course. Uh, that's pretty rude, but they are pretty rude. That's the way it is. Anytime people are going for that buck, you're going to find the rudeness. And if you're going for the buck, over and above your good book, I hope God punishes these people. Or... There's always um, redemption. Got to throw a word in there for redemption. After all, I claim to be Christian, so. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of a Christian I am, but I know Jesus was a bit uh, ticked off when it came to the rich and the money changers, you know, and the Pharisees and the scribes and all this and the tax collectors. He wasn't a big fan of theirs, and they were not fans of him. They killed him. Okay, the border zone, that's a pretty good issue for me. Um, also, one of my issues that's a few years old, which is good, is AMP. Um, automated, automated military presence, and I did a show on that. I tried to share it with people, but I think there's a boogeyman in my computer wherever I go that just shuts down these good ideas because the rich, they have the power to do that. So I'm wondering, is Google, and I don't know much about Google, but is Google and Facebook and all the big money media, I don't want to pick on the Cape Cod Times, I used to deliver the Cape Cod Times, but they have a way of being bought up by the rich. And they were caught doing a lot of political work in Britain, and they got called out for that. Rupert Murdoch, etc., doing political work, trying to get the rich have a way of getting involved there with the media. So I'm wondering, geez, is it all just one thing? Have they coalesced? Have they metastasized? You know, is it just futile that I fight for the as they say, fight the good fight, go the hard road, take the hard road, don't go the easy road. You know, is it all just futile? Does anybody like me who fights for the good fight 
Is it just like spinning wheels? I don't know. Maybe. I think there comes a point in time when the rich take over the world and there's nothing we can do about it. They own all the militaries of the world. So I'm worried about the rich people, big time, taking over and getting into the partnerships they have. In your editorial, you might list our vast natural resources. Out of the good earth of our country comes the wealth of precious metals. We own 80% of the world's gold, 60% of the silver, 28% of the copper, 27% of the iron ore, and 26% of the lead. The capacity of our steel mills is 92 million tons a year, and the rest of the world produces only 80 million tons. For all the people on Earth, there is an average per person of only three acres of land for growing things. But here in the United States, we have nearly six and a half acres of fertile farmland for every man, woman, and child. Almost twice our requirements for food and clothes. And yet, of the Earth's entire area, we constitute no more than a mere 7%. And of the world's population, Americans make up only 6%. In 1840, a man who was as short-sighted as he was sincere proposed an astounding measure designed to save the country thousands of dollars. It is obvious, and I am confident all will concur, that we have exhausted our inventiveness. And because there is nothing further for us Americans to devise and patent, no machine nor contraption that could possibly add to our virtue and well-being, I therefore crave your support of a measure to close the patent office. Close the patent office. And in the next 60 years came inventions that meant jobs for millions of men and women, that meant better living for all the world. applications for patents. Close the patent office? Why, we're just getting started here in America. Benjamin Franklin's discovery of the electric properties of lightning was in itself of little importance. But through the inventive genius of American engineers and the production genius of American management, Franklin's idea was given practical value and it changed the lives of every person on earth. To American homes came the doorbell, the washer, the refrigerator, the range, the iron, and many another work-saving household appliance. To the field of communication came the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, radar, and television, all for the enlightenment of mankind by the dissemination of knowledge. To the field of transportation came the trolley car, the automobile, the bus, the truck, and the airplane, all helping to free us from our environment for the easy exchange of goods and ideas with our neighbors. A kite and a key in a thunderstorm. And the world was changed by men of vision and determination, by Americans.
Well, we might as well get out and rest a minute. Okay, Sarge. This is pretty country, all right. Sure is. Folks are mighty nice, too. But somehow they don't seem to have any spunk. Yeah, everybody's all mixed up over here. Kind of going around in circles. That's one of the things I like about the good old USA. We're going somewhere in a straight line. And that's still the shortest distance between two points. Take that road we just came over. It looks like the people, all mixed up. Over here, they're always switching around from kings and emperors and czars and to these here dictators and what have you. They can't seem to make up their minds. That's because some big shot's always making up their minds for them. Everything's all cut and dried. If your father's a baker, then you're a baker. If he's a waiter or a clerk or a carpenter, then that's what you are. Over here, there's no chance to take a chance. Believe you me, Sarge, when I get back home, I'm going to declare my independence first thing every morning. I'm going to work wherever I want to, and nobody's going to tell me different. I'm going to go to any church I pick out. Nobody's going to stop me. I'm going to have my say on every doggone thing that goes on in town, and nobody's going to shut me up. I'm going to vote the way I want to, and think the way I want to. I'll probably get married. And if I have a kid, when he grows up, he's going to pick out the kind of work he wants to do, with no high pressure from me or anybody else. Yep, that's the way it looks to me from this distance. America's on the road, and what a sweet one. Plenty of work to do, plenty of fun when you're through. A road with a nice home on the side of it. Radios and automobiles and fishing trips. Hot dogs and cokes and a wife and a kid and your pals. A road as straight as a string. It leads to school, to church, to a good job. Maybe a business of your own someday. That's the kind of a road to travel. Then we'll be going places. Well, that's what we'd better do right now, go places. When enemies across the sea strike at liberty, then there is war. The young men go away to fight for our freedom. And not all of them come back. In times of national stress, we are compelled to abandon many of our hard-won privileges and prerogatives. When boards and bureaus and agencies take away parts of our liberty, we grin and bear it. But when the emergency passes, let us stoutly demand the restoration of our rights. Remember when coffee was scarce and we couldn't have a second cup? Of course we didn't like it. But the coffee shortage wasn't fatal. We lived through it. The big point is this. We gave it up to help win the war. And we got it back. So let it be with all our liberties that must be suspended when our enemies press about us. But must just as surely be restored that the spirit of freedom shall not perish. Liberty is not just a word, not just a statue, not just a slogan. It is a continuing thought, and its price is eternal vigilance. So let us be on guard against the enemies of liberty. Liberty was the flaming banner that sustained and inspired us on the land, at sea, and in the air, on the beaches, in the jungles, on the deserts, in the mountains in Africa and Italy, in the Aleutians and the Philippines, at Pearl Harbor and Bataan, in Normandy and New Guinea, in Burma and China. There is part of your editorial on what makes America great, Mr. Editor. The rest of it lies right outside your window. Quote figures on natural resources, but remember, still our treasures and our greatest assets are the boys' next generation the men and women of tomorrow who must be staunchly on guard if our freedom is to survive. Here is America in miniature. Organizing a ball game is not unlike starting a business. Nobody does it for you, you do it yourself. And nobody tells you that you can't. Of course there are arguments, that's typically American too. But eventually it seems we reach some sort of working agreement. Perhaps you grant a point to your competitor, makes a concession to you. That's good sportsmanship. That's American. Bet I can beat you to second base, and off they go. Competition is congenital in America. We're brought up in the tradition of beating the other fellow, fairly and squarely. In the game of life, every boy has an opportunity to take a swing at the ball. In America, you get a chance to take a chance. 
the farmer's son may feel the urge to fight the good fight for the freedom of the press. Well, one day the editor's chair will need a new occupant. We're going to need doctors and surgeons to heal our bodies. We're going to need inquiring minds to help keep the patent office open and to make new contributions to science and engineering for the service of all the people. Truly, opportunity in America is limited only by the initiative of the individual. Perhaps one of these boys will be moved to spread the word. In God we trust. We want more architects and painters and musicians to uplift us. We need teachers to keep alive in our youth the principles of freedom. We need women nurses and painters and musicians. And always we need good women who are content to make a career in the noble profession of motherhood. The farms are waiting for young men to till the soil. A seat in Congress that's within the power of an American boy or girl. Why, there's even a chair in the White House that the American people give to the man who merits it in the judgment of the electorate. Think of the opportunity that awaits these boys and girls. Each is free to select his chosen field and each knows in his heart that his life can be what he makes it. Equal opportunity for all. That is the cornerstone of the structure of freedom. Liberty is deep-rooted in all our sacred traditions. It guarantees decent, peaceful living and work well rewarded to all men of goodwill. And it reaches up and up into the light of a better day. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. I guess that'll wrap it up for today. Thanks very much for watching The Scandal Agenda. <laughs>